Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream of music, painting, event, poetry, object, film, and dance. A panel discussion on Yoko Ono's grapefruit. We have a wonderful panel prepared for you today, complete with great conversation, readings, and performance. My name is Ryan Doherty, and I'm curator here at Contemporary Calgary. Very pleased to be here. I'd like to begin by honoring and acknowledging that, the, that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, and Pekani, the Satina, the Stoney, Stoney Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We also like to acknowledge our immediate proximity to the Bow River, a site that resonates with, resonates with all of us today and with indigenous populations for thousands of years. I'd like to also thank our sponsors for making this event possible. In particular, our presenting sponsor, Moore, our exhibition benefactor, Gertrude Cohos, and exhibition patrons, Warren Jensen and Brenda Silver, Mode Models, and Carol Ryder. This panel is part of our public programming around the exhibition, Growing Freedom, which has two parts, the instructions of Yoko Ono and the art of John and Yoko. We're thrilled to offer these exhibitions to our Calgary community. And it gives me great pleasure to announce these exhibitions have been extended until March 14th, following the unfortunate gallery closures due to COVID-19. Yoko Ono's acclaimed artist book, Grapefruit, lends its weighty significance to much of the exhibition, including a range of her instructions originally included therein. No doubt grapefruit will be the seed to some fruitful conversation today as well. And maybe that's too much. Uh, this afternoon, I'm pleased to welcome Suzette Mayer, Ayumi Goto, and Billy Ray Belcourt, along with our moderator and self-proclaimed Yoko Ono fanatic, Dave Diamond. Mr. Diamond considers Grapefruit one of the single most important artist books ever made, and it has formed his own work in countless ways. It's the very multiplicity of its book, its impact on music, painting, event, poetry, object, film, and dance that is at the heart of this panel and that these esteemed guests will help to navigate. No doubt you'll have your own questions. Please feel free to add them to the Q&A section on Zoom or Facebook Live and we'll do our best to address all of them at the end. Without further ado, please welcome Dave Diamond to introduce himself and our panel. Thanks for calling me a fanatic right off the bat. <laughs> um, my name is Dave Diamond. I'm an artist based in Sackville, New Brunswick, which is built upon the unceded or stolen ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people, and we pay our respects accordingly. My practice typically consists of research-based conceptualism and involves an investigation into the ways that culture is formed and then how we subsequently use it, uh, how it impacts history and identity, et cetera, et cetera. I've produced books, records, DVDs, LSD, whiskey, photographs, billboards, performances, and works in a range of other media. Uh, these can be seen at dave-diamond.com. I also run a blog on the subject of artist books and multiples, titled the same, where Yoko Ono's work features regularly. As a curator, I included uh, Yoko's work in uh, two Nuit Blanche exhibitions, the first in Toronto in 2008, and later in Edmonton in 2015. A few years ago, I wrote about Ono's art and activism in Canada for the CBC website. Uh, it's true to call her my favorite artist would kind of be an understatement. So thank you very much everyone for joining us for a discussion about Yoko Ono's Grapefruit, a book published uh, over half a century ago, which still resonates with new audiences each year. I'm very pleased to be able to discuss the book in the context of creative writing with poet Billy Ray Belcourt, uh, as well as novelist and poet Suzette Mayer. And I'm grateful also to have performance artist Ayu, Ayumi Goto to help contextualize the book in terms of its performative qualities. Uh, we'll look at Grapefruit's importance as a document of fluxus, conceptual arts, sound art, postal arts, uh, performance arts, self-publishing, even as a pop cultural artifact. I can't think of another book, for example, that has its own promotional t-shirt. 
Uh, grapefruit helped instigate one of the most celebrated love stories of the 20th century and one of the most celebrated protest songs ever, the 1971 anthem, Imagine. For those unfamiliar with the term, uh, an artist's book is a book by an artist rather than about an artist, a book intended as an artwork, not merely documenting one. There are many important artists who have used the format of the book to make some of their most enduring work. Uh, Ed Ruscha, Dieter Roth, Hannah Darboven, Hans-Peter Feldman, Jenny Holzer, Taba Arbach, and many, many others. But I would argue that Yoko Ono's book, alongside maybe Michael Snow's cover to cover, is the most important artist book ever published. Most histories of conceptual art typically cite Joseph Kasuth uh, as the first artist to exhibit text as an artwork back in 1965, despite Ono exhibiting work uh, that were entirely text-based at George Machunis's AG gallery three years prior. If you're guessing that sexism and racism played a part in this discrepancy, you would be absolutely correct. Because Ono's work was written in her native Japanese, it was considered calligraphic and therefore part of the decorative arts tradition. Given the radical nature of the texts, it's difficult to see how there could be any confusion, but the error persists today. Some of these works, such as Painting to be Stepped On, later appeared in Grapefruit. Not only was Ono making early works in a wide variety of media and genres, she also produced quintessential examples. Cut Piece is, a powerful, is as powerful a work of performance art as any that exist. The piece in which audience members approach the performer and cut away small pieces of their clothes continues to be performed by other artists years later. Here is an image of Canadian musician Peaches performing it a few years ago at London's Meltdown Festival. Ono's multiples, such as Box of Smile and Play It by Trust, are as strong as any uh, multiple produced at that time or subsequently. The 1971 postcard, A Hole to See the Sky, is a classic example of male art. It has its origins in Grapefruit also, where it initially appeared as a sketch. Uh, Our Maze anticipates Dan Graham's practice by many years, and the War is Over campaign predates Jenny Holzer's use of advertising spaces by about a decade. Yoko Ono was a member of Fluxus, a loose-knit quasi-collective of artists best known for their performances and publications. Fluxus was the first art movement that could be considered international in scope. The group included Black artists, Ben Patterson, and Stanley Brown, Korean artist Namjoon Pike, who would later be celebrated as the father of video art, and several artists from Japan, Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Lithuania, the UK, the US, and even Canada to a lesser degree. It was the first art movement to include women as key members, not just Ono, but also Alison Knowles, Shigeku Kubota, Miyoko Shiomi, Charlotte Mormon, and many, many others. Fluxus impresario and publisher George Machunis described Fluxus as, quote, the fusion of Spike Jones, vaudeville, gag, children's games, and Marcel Duchamp. Their manifesto stated that the group's goal was to, quote, promote a revolutionary tide and a flood and tide in art, to promote living art, anti-art, and non-art, to be grasped by all peoples, not only critics, dilettantes, and professionals. Fluxus performances and publications both concerned themselves with what later became to be known as event scores, instructional pieces that could be performed by anyone, and sometimes without them knowing that they were performing a work at all. They ranged from simple gestures like Ben Vautier's The Destruction of All Art is Art Too, Please Tear This Up, from 1963 to the much more complicated Danger Music for Dick Higgins by Namjoon Pike, which directs the performer to creep into the vagina of a living female whale. Ono's scores in Grapefruit had a distinct element of poetry to them. Quote, take a tape of the sound of the snow falling, reads tape piece number three. This should be done in the evening. Do not listen to the tape cut it and use it as strings to tie gifts with. Here the act of recording becomes a different means of processing the idea. 
The recording is never listened to, and if it was, it would almost certainly be silent regardless. Most of the texts in the book begin with a verbal imperative to touch, feel, find, imagine. Stone piece, for example, reads, find a stone that is your size or weight, crack it until it becomes a fine powder, dispose of it in the river. A, send small amounts to your friends. B, do not tell anybody what you did. Do not explain about the powder to the friends to whom you send. The instruction is kind of deceptively simple, but also designed to be completed with one's imagination. Few people would have the ability to acquire and, uh, a stone that matched their size or weight, let alone grind it to a powder. The artist describes the works in the book as like seeds and not coincidentally, the sequel to Grapefruit, which was published almost 50 years later, is titled Acorn. Grapefruit was originally published uh, originally to be published by Fluxus, but letters lost in the mail led to her self-publishing the book, 500 copies in 1964, under the name Wunternam Press, which Fluxus would later distribute. The pre-sale price was $3, and it doubled after that. An antiquarian bookseller in Baltimore currently lists a signed copy of this edition for $35,000 US. Many of Ono's later works originated in the book and it can almost be read as a blueprint for her entire subsequent career. Yoko met Beatles John Lennon at an advanced private screening of her work at the Indica Gallery in November of 1966. One of the now legendary stories is, is that Lennon asked to hammer a nail in her painting to hammer a nail in, which had its origins also as an instructional work in Grapefruit. Wanting to keep the canvas pure for the actual opening the following day, Ono told the rich pop star that he would have to pay five shillings, which is about 50 cents now. Lennon proposed hammering in an imaginary nail for an imaginary five shillings. Ono sensed that they might be on the same wavelength. She later sent him a copy of Grapefruit in the mail, inscribed with a star chart based around his birth. Later, Lennon would later recount that he kept the book by his bedside table so that he could read and reread it nightly. Alternate, alternately frustrated and transfixed by the ideas that it contained. One day in a London bookstore, Ona was checking the O section to see if her book was being stocked and she found under L, John Lennon's two books of writings and drawings in his own right and a Spaniard in the works. She opened one to find a drawing of someone entirely covered with flies, which she immediately recognized was similar to one of her recent film ideas. They each recognized a kindred spirit in the other, falling in love via their publications. Many of the scores in Grapefruit open with the word imagine, such as cloud piece. Imagine the clouds dripping, dig a hole in your garden to put them in. This eventually led to the writing of Lennon's signature song. A few years ago, a poll of more than 50,000 readers of the Observer newspaper and Channel 4 viewers listed Imagine as the greatest song ever written. Lennon would express uh, in interviews later his regret at not giving Ono a co-writer's credit. He said, imagine should be credited as a Lennon Ono song because a lot of it, the lyric and the concept came from Yoko. But those days I was a bit more selfish, a bit more macho, and I sort of omitted mention of her contribution. But it was right out of her book, Grapefruit. There's a whole pile of pieces about imagine this and imagine that. If it had been Bowie, I would have put Lennon dash Bowie if it had been a male. But when we did imagine, I just put Lennon because you know, she's just the wife and you don't put her name on, right? In 2017, the National Music Publishers Association finally corrected the omission, adding Ono's name as a co-author to the track, which was celebrated with a ceremony in which Patti Smith performed the song. Simon & Schuster published a second edition of Grapefruit in 1971 and it has subsequently been redesigned and reissued several times, including translations into many other languages. The title has been in print consistently for almost 20 years now. Village Voice art critic David Borden called Grapefruit, quote, one of the great monuments of conceptual art. And in keeping with an art form interested in the decommercialization of art, the dematerialization of art, of ideas over objects, it seems somewhat fitting that this monument can now be owned by anyone 
with $20. The current edition is no less an artwork than the original version that now sells for upwards of $35,000 on the secondary market. It's better in some ways uh, as it has been updated to include later works. Yoko Ono's uh, illustrious career now spans uh, over 60 years. She's made drawings, films, performances, photographs, installations, and released over 20 albums as a musician. But no single work is more essential to her practice than Grapefruit. So I'd like to begin by inviting uh, Billy Ray Belcourt to join us. Um, I'm Billy Ray Belcourt from the Drift Pile Cree Nation in Northwest Alberta and Treaty 8 Territory. I am zooming in from Vancouver, where I live, uh, which is the unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, and I wrote some instructions for living and art making, uh, inspired by my reading of Grapefruit, a book whose uh, mystery and magic and unpredictability really captivated me. Um, and so I chose to write in the style um, that Yoko Ono seems to have really mastered in this book. Okay. Decolonial love piece. Hold your cookum's hand until she lets go. Decolonial love piece too. Make friends to save your life. Decolonial love piece three, construct a bed using love poems. Do not sleep anywhere else. Decolonial love piece four, love as if you have not already lost the war. Sky piece, fold the sky into little flowers. Plant them inside your home so as to be outside all the time. Map piece, look at a map and do not believe it. Map piece two, fill in a map using only indigenous place names. Forget they were ever called anything else. Sadness piece, stale hours cover your floor in the form of dirty clothes. T-shirt of regret, pullover of longing, gather everything, hold them in your arms. Call this spending time with yourself. Social media piece. Let all 1500 of your Facebook friends tell you they love you. Believe them. Writing for the forest. Write a poem on something compostable. Bury it in the soil. Reading like a forest. When something moves you, tremble. Writing like a forest. Stand in the rain. Record what it has to tell you about yourself. Writing like a forest too. Hide amongst the trees. Fall in love with them and hear everything. Poem about rural homosexuality. In a dimly lit bedroom, fight for the whole world. Poem about grief. In the palace of loss, color on the walls, keep nothing clean. Poem about healing. Do not make yourself into a beautiful wound. Poem about healing too. Wake up and invent the concept of happiness. Do not mind your calloused hands. Poem about growing up. The future is a decision you have to make on a cold morning when no one is watching. Make it. Poem about historical justice. Do not wait with cupped hands at history's barbed wire door. No one is coming. Poem to cry onto. Write a poem about loneliness. Cry onto it. Poem to outlive you. Write a poem about joy. Carry it with you everywhere until you die. Poem to abolish the police. Write abolish police on every blank surface you encounter. Poem to rewrite the history of North America from the point of view of the oppressed. 
rewrite the history of, of North America from the point of view of the oppressed. Call this your life's work. Poem about how to be fully alive. Feel everything. Hi, I'm Suzette Meyer, and uh, I'm the author of five and a half novels, and I have a poetry background. I'm also a professor at the University of Calgary, where I specialize in creative writing. In terms of my own artistic practice, oh, sorry, I want to begin by acknowledging, uh, by saying that I share in my acknowledgement of the land with contemporary Calgary. Thank you. In terms of my own creative practice, I write long form prose, that's my home base. And my central question when reading Grapefruit is when does instruction or proposition become constraint? But I mean constraint in the most generative sense. I learned of Yoko Ono as a conceptual artist approximately 30 years ago through the non-traditional route um, in that my former partner, Calgary visual artist, Lisa Braun, was an early member of United Congress, a mostly queer Calgary-based guerrilla artists collective formed in the early 1980s, early 1990s by Whitefield Senate. It's still in existence today. They had a reunion show recently. And in a recent communication with Lisa Braun, she told me that, quote, United Congress was reverential towards all things Yoko not limited to Lisa's copy of Grapefruit, end quote. So Yoko Ono was a big influence on their activities along with Dada. The Congress didn't document their shows because they were incidental. And according to Braun, the real work of the Congress was of UC was the propaganda. In the early 1990s, United Congress put on a show titled Yoko No Show. But before I show you the poster for that, I'll just show you two posters to give you some context. Uh, so there's BVM, which is a propaganda poster, and the uh, poster, The Castration of St. Paul, which was a poster for a uh, very controversial at the time show. And then, and then following that was the uh, Yoko No Show. So that's the poster there. Yoko No Show was a show of found objects. Around the same time that Lisa Braun was involved in United Congress, I was mostly writing and publishing poetry. So we were two artists living together and developing our art practices in our own separate media. And I was certainly influenced by Braun's visual work and her art philosophy. I was also taking poetry writing workshops with people like Fred Waugh, and so was exposed to constraint-oriented writing movements such as Ulipo or the Ouvoir de Littérature Potentielle, the workshop of potential literature, but Ulipo didn't really fit what I wanted to do, but I can talk about that more later if um, there are questions about that. The elements of grapefruit that especially resonate for me, and I love this book so much, are the instructions, particularly the impossible instructions or impossible constraints that Yoko Ono proposes in pieces such as blood piece. So blood piece goes as follows. Use your blood to paint. Keep painting until you faint. Keep painting until you die. So the concept of impossible instructions or impossible constraints or, or propositions um, presents really interesting opportunities for the looser long form of the novel in which I work. My most constraint-based novel is Monoceros, which I published in 2011 about a young queer man who dies by suicide after sustained homophobic bullying. And it's based on a true story here in Calgary that happened around uh, 2004 or so. And in writing this book, the ordering constraint or the ordering instruction, the ordering proposition was that I wanted to write 200 pages about a death that cannot be described with any words in any language. How do you speak the unspeakable? How do you write the unwritable? And it strikes me that this is one of the many features of grief is that being unable to articulate that grief. So one of the strategies that I used to fulfill this instruction was to include a series of obituaries, but they are obituaries of living people. And I'll end this very brief presentation, this very brief talk of mine with one of those obituaries. So this is an obituary that appears in the book. It's the obituary for the characters Max and Suzette. And just for context, Max is a self-loathing gay man 
who's about to go out on a first date with a drag queen named Suzette, who Max has never seen out of drag. So here's this obituary, Max and Suzette. The digital, the digital clock at the T intersection in front of the Ethiopian restaurant clicked 26.72 a.m. Max sat at the table the furthest, the furthest back and waited for Suzette. The red lampshade above and behind its head, a photo of an Ethiopian coffee field on the wall to his right. Ethiopian sun, he ordered a Guinness. They would sit together just like a regular couple and for the first time in his life, Max would not glance at the door whenever another customer swung in. He would not flinch away from talking too close. He might even kiss her right here at the table. He might even ask her to meet him in another restaurant after this date, a restaurant downtown, just a regular man and his beautiful girl. Max stepped into the washroom to wash his hands with pearly pink soap, checked his tieless self in the mirror, Suzette finished her cigarette before she entered the restaurant, butting it against a brick wall and slipping it into the trash can beside the restaurant entrance. Last night during her show, she did her dance of the 69 veils and she wished Max had been there. He would have appreciated her wig, the way she beckoned people in the audience to each tear away of clump of veils until she was naked in her gold cat suit. One of the waiters in the Ethiopian restaurant, Solomon, slapped her on the back and shouted, hello. His mother, Makeda, toddled over and smothered her in a hug. Suzette exclaimed over Makeda's new lipstick. Suzette's bald head smooth, four o'clock shadow bristling awake on her cheeks and chin. She wore a hint of shimmer on her cheekbones, her wig and the pink sherbet dress she picked out to wear tonight soaking in the sink at home because another drag queen, Vaseline Dion, dropped her waterproof eyeliner brush on them, the straw that broke the drag queen's back. She pulled on a plaid shirt and jeans, Vaseline Dion promising to buy Suzette cafe lattes for the rest of their lives. Come watch me now, Suzette thought, hunting for Max in the restaurant. Max straightened his tie and closed the bathroom door behind him. His time had come. He licked his lips dry. Thanks. Thanks, Suzette. That was great. Uh, I feel like we've had some bonuses, uh, both two, two readings, one of new works, uh, and then two works that are a response to Ono's book, Grapefruit, including uh, the following performance by Ayumi Goto. She's preparing for it now, so I will introduce her. Uh, Ayumi Goto is a performance artist currently based in Toronto. Born in Canada, she often draws upon her Japanese heritage and language to creatively challenge nation building, cultural belonging, and activism. Often working in collaboration, she also explores land, human, interrationality, impermanence, gender fluidities, and spatial temporal play. Ayumi has performed in London, Berlin, Naha, Kyoto, Nuuk, and across Canada. She has a PhD in communication study from Simon Fraser University uh, and is currently a postdoctoral fellow for Dr. Andrea Fatona's Center, the State of Blackness Platform at the Ontario College of Art and Design uh, University in Toronto. Uh, if you are ready, uh, you may, uh, it would be great to begin your performance. Thank <laughs> you. 
That was great. Thank you so much. Uh, Ayumi is going to decostume and join us again in uh, four or five minutes. But if uh, Suzette and Billy Ray were able to join, that would be great. Welcome back. Hello. Do we have Billy Ray as well? Perfect. So while Ayumi is uh, re-preparing to join us, uh, I thought I'd ask some questions that were particular to the two writers on the panel. Um, beginning with self-publishing, uh, it's, it's almost a lesser aspect of Grapefruit when the book is examined. And for me, self-publishing has sort of two sides. There's pejorative, if we don't like the book that has been self-published, it's we call it vanity publishing, vanity press. Uh, and it's the, you know, the domain of the privileged. And if we like it, it's kind of a punk rock, you know, DIY aesthetic, a kind of fuck you to the gatekeepers of the publishing world. Uh, you, of course, are both published by some of the more esteemed publishers in the country, Coach House Press, Annecy Press, et cetera. But I wondered what your experience was with self-publishing, either as something that you've done or that you contemplated doing. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll start. So um, when, I, when I was taking a poetry workshops or poetry class with Fred Watt years ago, um, he was always of the mind or, you know, I'm, I hope I interpreted this correctly, but he was sort of like, if you can't get published, publish yourself, make a magazine, start a chapbook. And so there were some really beautiful uh, chapbooks and, you know, beautiful publications like Second Wednesday Press, Disorientation Press, beautiful, very, um, you know, small print run documents that are just pieces of art in themselves. So I know that self-publishing has, you know, it does have a reputation uh, or it had a reputation um, for sometimes being inferior work, but, uh, but, but I don't think that's the case so much anymore. And when I think back to, you know, in the days when we were making magazines that were basically photocopied, you know, whatever with our own poems in them, it was like, that's how you, that's how you got out there. That's how you, that's how you made it in the world. Billy Ray? Yeah, I actually began as a writer uh, by publishing my poems on a blog that I had made. Um, sort of a very makeshift enterprise. I didn't know how to enter the literary world institutionally construed, um, but I wanted my work to be read. And um, I had written, you know, nonfiction, more academic things um, that have been published elsewhere. And so I knew I would have a bit of an audience at the very least. Um, so I put my poems up there and that's how the small press who published my first book, Frontenac House out of Calgary, uh, saw, saw my work and um, engaged with it. And um, so I, yeah, I think that there's something that can be subversive about um, self-publishing. I, you know, I think for a queer indigenous youth at the time, I was 19 or 20, um, having to, you know, enter an institutional world that you know, up until that point, I was relatively allowed a few people like you inside. You know, you have to invent your own, you know, path. You have to write, you know, as if you're making a landmark for a place that's nowhere. <laughs> um, you know, you have to write your own city streets and your own, in this case, you know, publishing opportunities into existence. And so, I, you know, I, you know, yeah, there's a kind of resonance as well with that aspect of, of Grapefruit's publication. Yeah, to me, I mean, uh, Grapefruit, but also many of Ono's peers and Fluxus, almost everything they published were, were I mean, published by Fluxus, but that was a, a kind of bedroom entity as well. Uh, and those things are now, you know, collected in museums around the world. We, we wouldn't know about Fluxus were it not for these publications. And that sort of Suzette, you mentioned Dada earlier, and I think you could trace a lot of that back to that as well. Artists kind of taking control of their own uh, media 
production and distribution, uh, later with mail art, which I also referenced. Quickly, I want to get to the back of the current edition of Grapefruit includes the word poetry, which I think su imagine suggests that that's the section that they hope that bookstores uh, stock it in. However, the book itself has seven or eight ca different categories, which appear in the title of this panel. The first one being music, uh, dance, event, objects, film, etc. And then the works enclosed are pretty much indistinguishable. Film tend to follow the, the rules of a film script, or at least to the degree that you would, might imagine Ono's films would. Um, but the rest are kind of indistinguishable. So I wanted to ask the, the two published poets um, how they feel about the word poetry being assigned to this volume. Do you want to start, Billy Ray? Yeah, I think that in this case, we could think of poetry as the name assigned to the activity of both awe and mischief. <laughs> I think that those are two of the main modalities that Yoko operates in, in this with this book. Um, and so, yeah, I know, I don't think it's a misnomer. I think it actually expands the terrain of possibility for the poetic. That's perfect. Suzette, thoughts? I, I, I always kind of have um, problems with these genre categories. I, and what I really appreciate about this work is that it seems to be testing the boundaries all over the place. Like I would, you know what, I'd love to call this a novel. Like, I don't see why it couldn't be, right? So um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I don't really believe in genre so much. Dick Higgins, who was a Fluxus artist and pub the publisher of the Something Else Press, which, made, which published a number of similar titles, uh, he once described, it was, I think the piece is called, uh, or is basically about describing Fluxus to children, to kindergarten students. And he said, sometimes sloshing your foot in a rubber boot is a better poem. And that always really stuck with me. Or I was just explaining to my partner about an hour ago that uh, the reason grapefruit is titled as such is that Ono mistakenly uh, believed the grapefruit to be a hybrid fruit. She thought it was a cross between uh, a lemon and an orange. And th the notion of hybrid was important to her. And I think that sort of comes through in those categories. Welcome back, Ayumi. You took less time than you thought. That was really great. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to begin with uh, an initial question asking people how they first discovered Yoko Ono's work because um, her celebrity often means that people have a name recognition with her that precludes their, uh, their experiencing her work directly. But you told me a pretty great story that I'd now like to put you on the spot and have you recount. Yeah, I have a very early childhood memory of, I think my mom had gone to like a secondhand uh, record store or uh, so, somewhere she found a, a cop, one of uh, Yoko Ono's records. And um, she, I think she thought that it was going to be like easy listening Japanese pop music or something like that. And then, so she put on the record and it was Yoko Ono's Fly. And I like my I was running around like a child because I was so scared and I didn't know what was going on and my mom was saying to like nobody in particular I think this may have, might have been a mistake so then for a long time I was actually afraid of Yoko Ono and that album cover I would always like run by like this um, but uh, yeah when I heard it recently again because I thought oh yeah I should just listen to it again and then I listened to it on YouTube and then I was like Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> so I appreciate it now. I'm not afraid of it anymore. It's a fly. <laughs> nice. um, can you speak as a, I know I noticed you began your performance by uh, showing us the, basically the score of the piece. Do you consider it that? Do you consider that that, that, the, that that same score could be maybe enacted differently by another performer? Yeah, um, first of all, um, um, yes, I will answer that question, but I do want to say that I did, I planned and organized and thought through this, uh, this performance of the score um, on Treaty 13, um, thinking about the people, the Haudenosaunee, uh, Miss, Mississaugas of the Credit, Huron Windat, and um, um, uh, Anishinaabe people, as well as there's a lot of Métis people living in Toronto area right now. So this is where the performance was made. And I do think that um, 
um, this, I mean, just like, you know, Suzette, I was really thinking about what you're talking about, impossible constraints. And I was thinking about that a lot. And I do wonder, um, are they actually impossible um, or are they improbable? Because um, I was thinking that there are infinite possibilities for how that score is going to be played. It's just like, it, it's my limitation that I only have a certain way of being able to do it. But then several others and several other, others would have other uh, ways of playing it. So um, yes, I want to see how others would interpret that score. And I did add like three more movements. So it ended at six. I don't know if you can see it now. It ended at six. But then I added uh, um, squeeze, eat, and drink. Because um, thinking about Billy Ray, I really loved your responsive poetry. And what is a constructive critique of uh, grapefruit, but to build, build on, so. Suzette, do you want to answer impossible versus improbable? I saw you taking some notes. Yeah, I was taking notes because I thought, I don't know how to answer this. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. I guess it's the ones where you're asked to die, you know, or to make art while fainted and that kind of thing. And so um, I think you're right. Um, it's not necessarily about impossibility, but how, how would you interpret that? How do you interpret what that means? So that's, I think that's a really good, it's a really interesting um, recasting of it that it's more about improbability and, and therefore, you know, what is, therefore, how is it possible? If it's impossible, how, how, how can you articulate the impossible? Yeah, yeah. I don't really have much to add, I think. I found myself taking a lot of notes too, many of which during your poems, Billy Ray, like pullover of longing, I quite like, and make friends to save your life. It feels like a sort of beautiful instruction. With Have you used that kind of direct language in your, in your work before, like the directive to the audience? Uh, sometimes, but rarely. And because I think that there's actually a bit of a aesthetic, um, disinterest in that kind the imperative it's almost unliterary to to direct or to be didactic um and so yeah that added another dimension of of aesthetic subversion um because i think that it and i even felt at times that i myself in writing these small instructions was approaching self-help the genre <laughs> of self-help um but then I thought, you know, and I also wanted to try to like reach for something profound, but then, you know, that the group is not about profundity, I don't think. Um, I think it's about, you know, mundanity more so. And, um, you know, but like, what is art if not, like, I mean, I write so as to figure out how to live better, more beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the art making is about living. And so why not, you know, why can't an instruction be the form in which one does that work? Um, and I also think on the question of improbability, I think what I took from the poems and that I tried to rework a little is the um, sort of sense of daring or provocation and so with, for example, the poem to abolish the police, there's, you know, you're confronted with the fact of the difficulty and, you know, structural improbability of an act like abolishing the police. But um, at the same time, there's, you know, the deep desire and sociological, political necessity, you know, necessity of that if we, um, want to remake the world as a place where flourishing is possible for everyone, for the racialized, et cetera. And so, you know, to live as if that is a possibility, um, I think is the ultimate uh, provocation, mm -hmm. at least as I saw it, of the book. And I mean, I was gonna note that you, yeah, brought in some very political aspects, whereas grape Grapefruit maybe yeah. feels almost decidedly apolitical or not political. But of course, Ono's later work, her activism and her art practice were entirely intertwined. And some of the th 
that some of the things that you just said remind me of obviously the notion of imagine peace or war is over if you want it, which can sometimes sort of seem a little benign, but frankly, I feel I've always thought that that piece, um, which initially functioned as a billboard and then five years later as a Christmas anthem and continues to be published as like full pages in the New York Times. Um, to me, that was about complicity, like that, that, that wars are waged in our name and that if we truly want them to be over, we like, or if, if they're go, ever going to end, we have to truly want them to be over. Mm -hmm. that, that there's a notion of personal responsibility in there. But also sort of more poetically, uh, there's a text that was I always felt really important in her practice. And I see that the Museum of Modern Art has just published it as a tote bag. And it says, uh, the dream we dream together is just a dream, but the dream we dream, or sorry, the dream we dream alone is just a dream, but the dream we dream together is reality. And uh, that, that essentially, uh, that, I, that's become like a major aspect in my life. Like I, I can, I'm looking at my partner and we basically relocated to, to New Brunswick because of that sentence. Like mm -hmm. this notion that we were gonna like collectively make this decision. Mm -hmm. um, Suzette, I re just realized while, some, maybe during, your, during the performance, that the question that I have for you is not really a question, but I just really want to say this. And that's, uh, the wood becomes a flute when it's loved is a lyric from a John and Yoko song that kind of has obvious connections to the writing in Grapefruit. And when I was reading the first chapter of your recent novel, uh, Monoceros, I, I really liked the opening lines, make a hawk a dove, stop a war with love, which I liked and then found out that it was quote from the theme song to the TV show, Wonder Woman. That's right. <laughs> how, how did you choose to include that as the uh, opening quotation in your novel? Uh, well, one of the star characters of the novel is a drag queen who dresses up like Wonder Woman. And so, you know, while I was trying to figure out how to, how to write this book, because that was early on, I looked up the lyrics to the song and there it was, the theme song to Wonder Woman. It's pretty amazing, at least isolated. I don't know, maybe the rest of the song doesn't hold up as much. No, the, it's, it's excellent. It's also excellent. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go to, we're gonna open it up to questions very quickly. I wanted to, Billy Ray, something in your writing reminded me of my, perhaps my favorite piece in Grapefruit, which for some reason I didn't include in my introduction. And the work that asks the viewer to collect the reflection of the moon and water with a bucket. Uh, and I think the last line is keep stealing until no moon is seen on the water. And that follows into one of those impossible things, or at least an almost kind of Zen-like meditation. Um, but I wondered, Billy Ray, if you could talk about some of the ways that you've used nature as this kind of uh, tangible material, things like folding the sky into little flowers uh, or walking upside down to break the clouds, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in those moments of like metaphorical um, uh, uh, detouring <laughs> or something like that, there's often, it often feels, often feels tangent tangential to the writing um, or to like, common sense. I was thinking of, you know, writing being less of, you know, less material, when it is less material and more metaphorical, what is happening? And I think, you know, theory um, is what happens. Uh, and that even in moments where we aren't given you know, something that feels of reality or tangible, um, that there is some sort of challenge being made in the realm of the emotional or, you know, in the affective. And I think of, you know, I was thinking of some of Fred Moen's work as I was reading Grapefruit and how often there are these, you know, beautiful and and uh, rebellious and unruly sentences 
in which it is easy to get lost and common sense sometimes, you know, isn't as discernible. And, but, you know, but I always feel that there's something about my practice of embodiment that has shifted in the aftermath of the encounter of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that seems as important a, uh, you know, an effective or, uh, you know, artistic uh, choice as, you know, writing, you know, quote unquote, accessibly. And perhaps, you know, how I've channeled that sense of, you know, the, ironically, how I've channeled that sense of the theoretical is by way of the natural world. Um, and, you know, because I think that there's a lot we can learn about, you know, aliveness from, from a forest, for example. That's very beautiful. Thank you. I see that it is uh, exactly eight o'clock my time, four o'clock uh, or five o'clock Calgary time. Uh, we are officially over, but I'm wondering if Ryan has any questions from the chat feed. Hi everyone. Just want to say, first of all, that was a uh, fantastic hearing from all of you. Uh, your readings and your performances were very moving and uh, I feel honored to have seen them tonight. I do have a question so far, and I'd like to encourage people on the call to write them in. Um, one question here we have is, what is the best reason to read grapefruit for those who never have? Who wants to take that? You, me? Uh, sure. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, there are many reasons, but um, it makes you dream big. And whether you dream big for like um, a very particular, like political reason, social, familial, creative, um, it takes you, it takes, I think it might give you the reader, the new reader, an opportunity to uh, reimagine from a different perspective. And whether it's a perspective of a human or a non-human. And, um, and I think if we can dream bigger, then we open up our hearts and we open up our capacities to meet strangers or unexpected encounters that we didn't think were possible so and it's 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 fun um but it's also very serious too so um i think it it covers a big emotional intellectual and creative range and it's it's good for like all ages of people <laughs> well, Suzette? um i think a reason to read it uh would be that the book allows anyone to be an artist follow the instructions and you too will be an artist you too will be able to make art and i think that's basically it it's in, an incredibly liberating book in so many ways billy ray yeah just to reiterate that point especially that it really widens the scope of artistic possibility and that um everyone has the ability to to, to make art I can't summarize it better than that. <laughs> For me, like a number of artist books, it's not a book that you need to read uh, cover to cover. You don't have to read it sequentially. It's the kind of thing that you can keep on your nightside table as Lennon did or on your coffee table or mantle and just pick up, read a single page, contemplate it for the rest of the day. And, you know, and the book could last you years. We have a few more questions pouring in, so this is great. Um, one question here, how much are Yoko's records informed by grapefruit, do you think? I adore her music and songs like Song for John make explicit reference to grapefruits. Anybody? I'm happy to take that. Um, I have, I believe all of her records, some of which I, when Ayumi told her story about her mother accidentally buying grapefruit, I imagine for a couple of dollars, like a, or accidentally buying Fly, uh, her second solo album, I got very jealous because I waited years to be able to find a copy to buy, let alone afford a copy. There was a time when they were selling for, you know, 50 and $60 back when that was probably now a hundred or $200. Now many of them have been reissued and are available. And of course you can stream them wherever. Uh, I think lyrically, particularly the, the, the song that I quoted earlier, um, wood becomes a flute when it's loved, mirror becomes a razor when it's broken. 
I think a lot of those ideas uh, follow through. There's a few pieces. There's a work that asks you, uh, in Grapefruit that asks you to push an empty baby carriage around. Uh, that later became a song. Um, I think it's more about the spirit though. I, I think the spirit uh, influences all of her music. If people are curious, I would recommend some of the earliest pieces like Plastic Ono Band uh, and Fly, as well as the kind of comeback record uh, in the mid nineties, um, I think it was 95, her record Rising. And I just had a little, because Phil Spector produced it, who just died two, day, two days ago, the, the murderer Phil Spector. Um, sees, he produced Season of Glass, which came out maybe six months after Yoko watched her husband shot dead in front of her. And to me, it's a devastating album about grief, like from hearing gunshots play before a song to her voice cracking up. And I think initially Spectre had said that he could produce it in such a way that no one would even know it was a Yoko Ono record, which he probably thought was a selling point. And she thought, I want people to know it's a Yoko Ono record, actually, and essentially fired him. Like he produced two of the tracks on the record and she kind of took it over later on. And in the liner notes, she said at first she wasn't sure that she wanted to release this record because her voice was breaking and she was just in too much grief. And then she thought that uh, there were probably a lot of people whose voices were breaking and who were experiencing grief and maybe that she could sing with them. And that just totally won me over. Like I, when I first got that record as a teenager, I played it incessantly. I feel like I brought the tone down. Are there, is there... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, a fairly easy, quick question here for you, Billy Ray. Um, are the instructions that you shared today published or available anywhere? Uh, no, I mean, I stole a couple of things from poems I've already written. So <laughs> folks might have recognized those lines. Uh, but no, I just have been writing them over the last week and saw what, you know. Do, do you think they would make their way into a chapbook or a, a volume? I mean, I, I'm i not sure. I really don't know. Um, I, I was thinking of just posting them on Instagram. What's your Instagram account so people can follow? Uh, Google Billy Ray Belcourt, probably easiest way to find it. Perfect. Thank you. I want to, I want to revisit them too. I'm just going to jump in on not a question from the audience, but just mentioning Instagram and how um, it's an interesting time for something like Yoko Ono and instructions where the internet has enabled the distribution in a much different way, such as through social media and through other, other ways like that. And I wonder if anyone wanted to talk about um, something to do with her capacity in her, in her work to be so simplistically complex and if it has a natural affinity to the internet and that sort of um, fight for attention, but here and done in such a simple way that, that you can actually grab someone's engagement quickly through these. I don't know if anyone had any thoughts about that. If that even makes sense. <laughs> Suzette, Billy Ray? Are you me? I, I agree, I concur, Ryan, that Twitter feels, for example, like a, a perfect place to share these near haiku-like poems. And one of her more recent artist books, and I can't remember, if, I think it's called The Other Rooms. I have it over there. Um, I believe those began as these similar to Great Street, maybe slightly shorter texts that were, that were published initially on Twitter for the over the course of a year and then collected in a similar size, you know, thick square volume like this. But yeah, she is very active. I mean, she's 88 in a month. Like I think we're a month away exactly from her birthday uh, and she turns 88, but is very active on uh, Instagram and Twitter in particular. And I think there is this nat yeah, natural affinity for that kind of thing. Or even, I just, sorry, go ahead, Billy. Oh, I just I just found this uh, Twitter account that makes up possible Yoko Ono tweets <laughs> called Yoko Ono Bot. So <laughs> I think there's your answer right there. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. The web can automate them. Great. So there's still quite a few questions here. Um, one I'm going to answer very quickly, uh, which is that will this full panel discussion readings and performance be available for viewing after today? Uh, the answer is yes. We're going to make this uh, available very soon. We're hoping um, before the end of the week. Um, next question is: Has anyone reread Grapefruit during the pandemic, and how has that um, how has your perspective changed in the book in light of COVID nineteen? I 
I imagine we've all reread it recently, and at least in advance of this. Did, did anything jump out as particularly uh, pandemic related, Ayumi? Yeah, um, maybe this is related to because I do I do approach grapefruit as a performance book, um, just um, out out of, out of my interest, as well as like what Suzette was saying about really doing away with genres or like contesting genres because it kind of all melts together. But um, I find that um, it's a because uh, live performance is uh, is a uh, difficult to do at this time to read to read grapefruit. It's like with COVID, there's like this big pillar um, that covers all of these cells of Zoom rooms, right? So even though we're in different rooms, the mood or the taste of the air is is COVID. And so grapefruit becomes maybe another carapace or um, a, another possible world where it everything doesn't have to be um, constrained or uh, limited to our, our very visceral and political reactions to the the to COVID disease. So I think reading it now, um, the lightness becomes a serious endeavor. Is that? I think Ayumi summed it up perfectly. Um, it's interesting reading the, the, the pieces that rely on going outside and interacting with other people because now it's impossible. Well, no, it's probable, <laughs> it's possible. I just don't want to do it. So, you know, I think that's, a, yeah, that's about it. An interviewer asked uh, Yoko Ono once the, the origins of her sort of conceptual piece. And uh, I guess by virtue, much of all conceptual art that followed. And she traced it back to a time during World War II when her and her brother uh, were stranded and hadn't eaten food for days uh, in Japan. And she said that she would comfort him by kind of uh, imagining menu, like imagine creating imaginary menus for him, talking about food that they might one day eat in the future as a way to sort of soothe him or calm him. And somehow that feel, you know, now that we're back in an a sort of international crisis. Maybe those ideas sort of resonate further. Uh, maybe, maybe one or two more and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I was just to say there's a couple more and then I think we will probably finish up. Um, one question which might uh, be interesting. Why do you think it's taken this long for Canada to look at Yoko's work in this way, uh, you know, including recent presentations at the Gardner Museum or here at Contemporary Calgary or at Phi Foundation of Montreal. And do you agree that it's, that it's taken a long time or have we actually been looking at her work? Um, well, I think I mentioned in my introduction that I had written a piece about Ono's connection to Canada and there have been, a, you know, she, the, the first live record her and Lennon released was re recorded in Toronto and the, the album is called Live Peace in Toronto. So there's a long connection. Uh, I think just in general, like when she had her one woman show titled One Woman Show at MoMA a few years ago, uh, I initially thought, I don't need to go to New York to see that. I've seen all those works uh, in person before in various shows. Uh, and I just happened to be there anyway. And we went to see the show and like I was nearly in tears because all of this work that had been something that felt so marginalized my whole life, you know, like I would track down her records. Nobody wanted to listen to them with me. I would I, uh, hunt down her book and read it. Nobody cared. Like there was, I, I could find very little in the way of shared experiences with other Yoko fans. And then I walked into this exhibition and there were old people and chill, you know, like people in their eighties, people, uh, under 10 running around the show in like there was no kind of scowls or furrowed brows or any and I, I don't know maybe you can speak to that Ryan to, to the to the audience reaction that you've encountered but to me everybody seemed entirely open to it and it was just such a difference from my experience you know like th there were times when comics would make jokes like uh, if only Mark David Chapman had aimed a few feet to the right like imagine and living through that. So yeah, maybe, maybe you can talk about the way that audience have, uh, audiences have responded in Calgary. Uh, it's, it's much like you're describing. We've had a, a wide range of audience uh, when we're not closed for COVID. 
that is, <laughs> but uh, very engaged in the work. Um, I, I think that unfortunately the connection to the, the Beatles has done her art practice a bit of a disservice because there are still a great number of people who come in here with this perception of Yoko as, you know, John's wife and, and broke up the Beatles. Like that's, it's which this sort of absurd sort of belief, but they leave feeling differently. And so I, I like that. I like that a lot. Like the, the, the exhibition that we have up is broad and has, uh, you know, work that, again, it comes down to that sort of idea of, of attention and accessibility that, that her work has. There's just such a, you can, you can dive into it so quickly that, and, and it's beautiful. And it, when you're, when you make art as an artist, as Suzette and others were saying, so, um, but do I think, is there a reason why we've avoided it? I'm not sure uh, in Canada. It seems like there has been maybe a bit of a renaissance for Yoko in general right now. Um, partly, I mean, she, her work in Venice may have you know, stimulated some of that interest around the world uh, and certainly here too. Let's take uh, and then, unless anybody else has something they'd like to add, sorry. I was actually thinking about when we were first gathering like uh, with Billy Ray and Suzette um, and uh, Billy Ray, you had said that you, you had read this, you had approached it for the first time and you, you knew of her as a pop culture icon. And, and um, it really made me think about the Japanese artist Hokusai uh, because like he, he uh, did prints and painted and made art for like multiple decades. And every time he changed his name, like he changed his name over 30 times. And with each, change of name it was such a significant change of person so i went to a show of his, a retrospective of a show in tokyo in 2019 and it was fascinating to see the different age groups of people there and people who are approaching his work for the first time a lot of artists you could tell because i was eavesdropping on conversations and they're like how do you think he made that stroke oh we could make that let's let's do that for this story and and it just made me think that maybe there's not one yoko ono but there are multiple yoko onos mm. Very true. Uh, let's let's. Uh, I'll take you know one more question. We'll just finish things up here, and it's a little bit um, um, broad, but maybe it could spark a story or two out of you, much like Ayumi's story about you know fly. Uh, <laughs> has has Yoko's art, music, and writing how has how has her work influenced the panel in, in specific ways? So whether there's a, a maybe there's a, an additional story that you might be able to tie into how it's um, impacted your practice. Well, or, big... will it, or maybe can I put it future forward? How about will, how will it impact your practice now that you've kind of engaged deeply with the book? I'll start uh, reluctantly, clearly. <laughs> um, for me, I, th I mean, artist books, I worked at Art Metropole for a number of years. I run a blog on the subject for probably about seven years, publishing almost daily. There's about 4,000 entries on this blog. Um, every work that I begin to make starts as an artist book, and then I have to fight it. I have to fight it to not be a book because I don't want to practice it as just bookmaking because um, I need to pay my rent, for example. Uh, but to me, like, I consider this one of the, I hate to use the word seminal, but you know, one of the most important sort of groundbreaking artist books that then led the way for others. So that it is, I mean, I still have to define an artist book anytime I ever discuss one. Like imagine talking about any other art form and having to explain what it is at the beginning, but it's just a prerequisite pretty much when you're discussing artist books to anything but uh, a small selective group of people. But for me, yeah, like, like the fact that uh, the grapefruit is at the center of an artist's practice is pretty important to me because that's like anything I want to do, I want it to be a book first. That's lovely. But I don't want to end there. Somebody else, please. <laughs> I like the freedom that she represents um, as an artist. And uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm gonna confess that I'm pretty new to, um, to 
understanding what fluxus is and what it means. Um, but I, I really, really, I can feel uh, myself gravitating towards that kind of idea that is sort of opposite of the commodification of literature that's happening right now. Like there's just so much bound up in the competition and the prizes and which press are you with? And it's just a, it's a race and I will always lose that race um, because I don't care, you know what I mean? And so I love that she presents this alternate way of being an artist. And so that's definitely what I'm taking away from this. That's a gorgeous summary. If nobody has anything to ask, I'd be delighted to end right there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I want to thank Contemporary Calgary for asking uh, me to participate in this. I want to thank all of the panelists who have saved the day here tonight. Um, and everybody for joining in. I don't know. I saw some initial numbers. They seem pretty high. I, I'm, I'm hoping that some people are joining us. I'm hoping people will watch maybe a re-edited version later on that uh, solves some of those initial hiccups. Um, but yeah, thank you again. It was a delight. Appreciate it. And thank you, Dave. You did a wonderful job moderating. Appreciate everybody's help on the panel. Thank you, Suzette, Naomi, Billy Ray. Really appreciated it so much. Thank you all. It's so all great, great to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.